Just give us your sense of the South African um, employment environment and labor relations. We've seen a lot of industrial action this year. Yes, we have. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's the, the picture is not a bit skewed at the moment. If you mm -hmm. look at the private sector, it has been relatively calm. There have been strikes, there have been issues on the table, and there have been very good wage settlements. But I wonder to what extent we aren't misinterpreting the situation where the real problems, where the real publicity has been, has actually been in the, in the public sector, yeah. in the uh, local authorities, uh, the central government. And I think that is cause for concern there. Uh, mm. I've just, I'm busy now with a seminar together with clients or to, with colleagues of mine dealing with developments in the last year and, uh, with involving LexisNexis. And what's finally, what we find interesting from the audience is how this concern about what is going on in, in the public mm. sector is a huge issue. Uh, not only the violence that you hear, and the, but also why do they, do they not find it possible to reach settlements mm. uh, unless going on strike? Remember in 2007 we had a, large, a long strike as well, now in 2010 we have another one. And what is going on? What are the reasons for that? And but couldn't it be, some people would argue that the reason why we seem to think things are a lot more benign mm. in the private sector is because the private sector is not employing. It's retrenched massively during the recession. People are home and unemployed. And those who have held on to their jobs are just desperate to hold on to their jobs are not going to rattle the cages. I think that is one of the factors the private sector employees have learned you know, hard lessons in the last year. That doesn't mean that they aren't prepared to negotiate fairly effectively and vigorously if they want to, but there is that reality that has seeped in, into, into various industries in any case. And yes, that is a lesson that's learned. And bargaining structures are much more uh, mature in the industries. People have been negotiating in the private sector you know, for a long time now. Let's talk about this concept of labor brokers because this is an issue that the labor unions have been banging on and banging yes, on and yes. wanting the government to intervene. What exactly is a labor broker? A labor broker is a, an, a, a business that hires employees. It hires its own employees. But those employees do not work for, if I can use the word work for, for that labor broker. The labor broker places them with a client. And that client plays a fee to the labor broker uh, for the provision of that person. And that person will work for various lengths of time within the organization of the uh, client. And you, the, the, the relationship is a difficult one or an interesting one. What is the relationship between the person working who has been placed with the labor broker, or uh, been placed by the labor broker, and the client? It looks almost like an employment relationship. Mm -hmm. And some people will argue and say there's another employment relationship right. between the client and the, the employee as well. Okay, what should be done to make the boundaries a little bit clearer? Well, you know, the Department of the Kasatu wants to ban them completely. Yeah. There was a report released by the Department of Labor uh, last year where the Department of where, where the report indicated that should be a more nuanced strategy. They should be regulated rather than banned. May perhaps some forms of labor broking should be treated more harshly or more severely than others. And I think that's the debate. And my personal view is that I think labor brokers play an important role in regulating market flexibility, as it were, especially those labor brokers where people are placed to on a temporary basis. Yeah. You know, for example, if somebody's ill or there's a specific project requiring specific sp skills, I think that is a very important role for labor brokers in the economy. Well, in terms of dispute resolution, because we've seen a lot of mm. disputes this year, ultimately, where do the liabilities fall and who's ultimately responsible for the employed person in South Africa? Well, as far as liabilities are concerned, that's a, a, you know, the point there is we, we normally see the liabilities are the employer's liabilities. If there's a strike, it's the employer that loses money, that loses uh, markets and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But what is actually interesting is that, and this has come up in one or two recent decisions, you're finding that third parties are starting to complain and to, and to consider legal steps against unions, for example, to prevent losses or to prevent their business being harmed. For example, in the Cape, there was a, a decision recently where uh, the South African Transport and Allied Workers Union had tried had protest had a, a legal a, pro a legal protest march, but during the course of that protest march, certain damage was caused, and the Regulation of Gatherings Act provides that the union in that type of situation or the organizer of the protest march can be held liable. And you're seeing third parties coming along and saying, "We want to we want to uh, claim damages now." You mentioned earlier on that bargaining councils seem to work in a lot more structured and uh, sophisticated manner in South Africa, but 
industry and indeed even government in this instance, they all concur on the fact that what we've seen in terms of the public sector mm. strikes as bargaining councils don't actually seem to be working well yeah. because the wages that are being demanded are almost threefold above what the inflation mm. rate is in the country. The country is coming out of a, a recession. The margins, whether you're talking about public mm. sector margins or private sector profit margins, are so mm. low that it's actually unrealistic. And it, and it suggests that people within the bargaining mm. council are either not thinking or they're just simply recalcitrant. Yeah, look, this is a theme that we've had in these seminars as well. What is going on? You know, the, the, the people that say we've got the most sophisticated statutory arrangements, we've got bargaining councils, we've got all these processes and procedures in place, but why aren't they working? Uh, they, I, I think they work in the, the private sector to a large extent. We've had strikes, but not that bad. Why is it not working in the public sector? And, you know, you talk to the experts and you talk to the people who get involved and it, it's more, you know, it's maybe the relationship isn't that mature that we haven't that, you know, it's, a, it's a, a new type of system in the public sector, maybe five, six years old. It takes time to build up a, a, a working practice. The other people in the seminar have complained about leadership on both sides. You know, they say there's simply no leadership there. They aren't doing the job properly. An interesting development also is if you talk to the people, they'll say, well, you know, there were broken promises. In 2007, there were promises made or undertakings given and they haven't been complied with. Now, I don't know the merits of those allegations, but you can see it's not legal problems, it's actually an ethos, if you can use that word. Things that just haven't gelled in a collective bargaining structure. It's also a very wieldy collective bargaining structure. If you look at the huge civil service, it's a, you know, it's a huge organisation. Uh, you know, it's much bigger than many bargaining councils. Andrew, come into the conversation now. I mean, have we failed to design appropriate systems of dispute resolution in the country, or are the inequalities just so vast that, of course, it's become an emotive issue, wages and work? I think, it, uh, I think the emotion, emotive issues are certainly there, but I think it maybe comes back to a lack of leadership and, to some, to some extent, some sort of political indecision where you've got, within a ruling sort of structure, you've got a huge sort of tug of war between uh, central and sort of leftist tendencies Mm -hmm. and uh, muscle is being flexed in order to sort of uh, shift the, the balance of power. Unfortunately, the primary re uh, resolution mechanism um, sits in, in the form of strikes, which can be very, very destructive. When you look in the South African context and you come back to labor brokers, is um, you have to look in the context of economic growth that has resulted in the loss of jobs. Mm -hmm. We currently have an unemployment rate of probably close on 20% officially, unofficially north of that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, unless we get economic growth up, that will never be addressed. And to, to do, to do that you need to have labor flexibility and maybe you, you know the unions might be quite keen to see the back of or to see the end of, of labor broking mm. but that's because they get bypassed by the process let's, yes let's talk true. about the structural mm. inefficiencies within the economy just based on what Andrew says I mean earlier on today I was at a, a session about economic transformation and the ruling party labor industry made their submissions but a point that kept on being articulated by Cosato is we need a minimum wage in this country whether it makes economic sense or not for the companies. We need it because people need a fair chance, people need a, de a decent income. You need to absorb people into the economy, all sorts of other issues like that. There are structural problems within this economy. The, the, uh, you know, I'm not an economist, but I would agree with that point of view. I think the, you know, if you look at the typical, uh, well, this is statistics that I've read somewhere, that you know, every, for every employee in a, in a job, he's supporting eight or ten people, yeah. and that causes these structural problems that you face, and the, the causes the, 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 the militancy, as it were. So you know, there's not much from a legal perspective you can do, and I suspect that the higher the, the wage, the, the more there's going to be, you know, the jobs will move to China or to Thailand or wherever it is. I mean, we're having this problem in the. Uh, it won't lead to stability, do you think, in terms of labour relations? Well, I think it probably will, but I'm not certain it'll lead to social stability in the end. Mm. And that's the trade-off that's being taking place. Okay, within this uh, tack, let's talk about what's happened within the private sector. And I know this is a peculiar example. It's not reflective mm -hmm. of what's going on. But you look at the situation of the Aurora mine. Shareholding changes, new management, um, heavy debt for the mine and the new owners don't really service the debt. And what's worse, they keep people working without pay, mm -hmm. without any safety nets, without any food... Um, mm -hmm packs and, and those sorts of things. And this is the private sector in this instance. Mm. And the laborer is not protected. Well, the laborer is protected in terms of the law. But if, you haven't, if the, the employer is not prepared to cooperate, then you've got to use enforcement mechanisms. And they seem to be not being applied at the moment, as far as I can see from the newspaper reports. So yeah, the law's there, but they aren't being enforced. And it, it may not be possible to enforce them very effectively. There are also health and safety issues at that mine. And you know, there are limits as a lawyer in the law. We've got to worry about social security measures. We've got to worry about 
that type of thing. And for the, for the purpose of this is, you know, you, that company is now going to compete in the labor market with the big mining companies. Right. And, and, and if you're going to have centralized bargaining, as the Chamber of Mines does, how are you going to accommodate these smaller operations? And just finally, I mean, obviously in South Africa, there's the whole issue of the skills deficit and whether or not we should be um, attracting skills from outside of the country and what sort of laws apply to them. Now, generally people say, well, South African laws apply mm. for a South African, mm. for an, an entity operating in South Africa. But there is a sense that um, the laws around migrant workers, immigration and labor standards are applied differently to foreign workers and whether they are foreign workers who are on the high end of the salary scale or those who are base. You know, my impression is that the laws are applied every, to everybody. Uh, you know, yes, there's a distinction between the senior executives and the migrant worker who comes from a neighboring country. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect what is happening, of course, is that many of the migrant workers with us from the neighboring countries aren't being aren't being employed in formal employment. They may be in formal employment when the law simply can't be enforced against them. And, but that's not a problem relating to migrant workers. It's just that they are in those jobs per se. They come in and they take those jobs uh, and in the informal sector. And it's very difficult to enforce those laws there.